Once again, Our Lady came to a world in crisis in 1917. 1917, the year the Masons celebrated 200 years of organized masonry with our banners carried in procession through the streets of Rome to St. Peter's that depicted Satan conquering St. Michael. And most important of all, the year when Marxist atheism conquered Russia. In that same year, 1917, our Lady selected Portugal for her visitation, a country in which Freemasons had taken control of government since 1910, and due to Masonry, religious orders had been forced to abandon community life. She opted to come down from heaven to warn the world at Fatima in Portugal. It all began when three young Portuguese children, Lucia, Francisco and Jacinta, had a series of visions of an angel in 1916 and of the Blessed Virgin at monthly intervals from May 13th to October 13th, 1917, in a sheep pasture near the remote village of Fatima. Our Lady had promised a miracle so that all may believe on the 13th of October. This was to be a great climax, the great sign, and because it was promised, a vast crowd from all over Portugal had come to Fatima on that day. We have already seen on these tapes that the great miracle of Fatima, the solar prodigy, is a solidly established historical fact. In the first reporting of the miracle of Fatima in the Lisbon newspaper, O Seculo, the managing editor, the Almeida, who had witnessed the miracle, referred to Fatima as, quote, this now famous spot located on the poor pasture land high up on the Sierra. The Catholic Church's recognition of the authenticity of the Fatima apparitions of Her Lady was published on October 13, 1930. The Bishop of Liria, the Silva, declared the visions of the children worthy of belief and officially authorized the cult of Our Lady of Fatima. In the same letter, Bishop de Silva wrote about the fortunate crowd who witnessed all the manifestations of the sun which paid homage to the Queen of Heaven and Earth, noting that it was not a natural phenomenon. So the predicted public miracle for the 13th of October 1917 became a historical event, but to do justice to it, one has to accept the message of Fatima, which the solar miracle underscored in such a dramatic manner. By this miracle, God had put a stamp on the Virgin's words. When Our Lady appeared on the 13th of July 1917, according to Lucia, she promised the October miracle so that everybody may see and believe. Our Lady there and then showed the children what she wanted believed, especially by all human beings. After requesting the children to pray and sacrifice themselves for sinners, Lucia tells us, Our Lady showed us a great sea of fire which seemed to be under the earth. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form like transparent burning embers all blackened or burnished bronze, floating about in the conflagration, now raised into the air by the flames that issued from within themselves, together with great clouds of smoke, now falling back on every side, like sparks in a huge fire, without weight or equilibrium, and amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. The demons could be distinguished by their terrifying and repellent likeness to frightful and unknown animals, all black and transparent. This vision lasted but an instant. How can we ever be grateful enough to our kind Heavenly Mother, who had already prepared us by promising in the first apparition to take us to heaven? Otherwise, I think, we would have died of fear and terror. We then looked up at Our Lady, who said to us so kindly and so sadly, You have just seen hell, where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved, and there will be peace. The war is going to end, but if the people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. When you see a night illumined by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given you by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war.
famine and persecutions of the Church and of the Holy Father. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the Church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, and then follow the secret that has not been revealed publicly. The Second World War has proved that from 1917 to 1939 the Fatima warning went unheeded. Although the 1939 war broke out in the reign of Pope Pius XII, Lucia said that the Second World War actually began with the invasion of Austria in 1938 while Pius XI was Pope. The forewarning of chastisement, a nice illumined by an unknown light, as a great sign given by God to announce punishment by war, like the miracle of the son of Fatima became a matter of history. Lucia saw it, the vast display of the aurora borealis seen all over the northern hemisphere on the night of the 25th, 26th of January 1938. It was seen from Gibraltar, the only time in living memory. The red glare woke people and animals all over Europe. People poured into the streets was seen in Rome and Sicily. The Times of London reported that simple folk interpreted the phenomenon as supernatural sign, and older peasants thought it portended disaster. The New York Times gave it most of a page. Lucia broke her silence and wrote to the bishop to tell him that this was the great unknown light which during the apparition of July 13, 1917, Our Lady has said, would come as God signed that war, famine, and persecution of the church would be sent upon the world. As she wrote, war is imminent. The sins of men will be washed in their own blood. Years later, she wrote a memoir to the effect that she believed that the light in the sky that night could not possibly have been an aurora borealis. And she wrote, Be that as it may, God made use of this to make me understand that his justice was about to strike the guilty nations. For this reason, I began to plead insistently for the communion of reparation on the first Saturday of the month and for the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. It is interesting that a bulletin of the Astronomical Society of France reporting on that night of the red glare had the following, an immense blood-red glow was extending over the sky. If that winter's night lit up by a strange red glow all over the northern hemisphere in January 1938 seemed like a remote warning of the approaching Second World War, one need not search in vain for a warning of a similar nature much closer to the event. One could say that it is unwittingly recorded in the memoirs of Albert Speer, published under the title Inside the Third Reich, Weidenfeld and Nicholson, 1970. Speer, in the month of August 1939, was a member of a group who drove with Hitler to his retreat called the Eagle's Nest. Speer recalls how Hitler said to them, perhaps something enormously important will happen soon, even if I have to send Goring, but if need be, I would even go myself. I am staking everything on this card. Barely three weeks later, on August 21st, 1939, we heard that the German foreign minister was in Moscow for some negotiations. During supper, a note was handed to Hitler. He scanned it, stared into space for a moment, flushed deeply, then banged on the table so hard that the glasses rattled, and exclaimed in a voice breaking with emotion, I have them, I have them. Seconds later, he had already regained control of himself. No one dared ask any question, and the meal continued. After supper, Hitler called his entourage together. He said, we are going to conclude a non-aggression pact with Russia. Here, read this, a telegram from Stalin. It briefly acknowledged the agreement that had been reached. 
To see the name of Hitler and Stalin linked in friendship on a piece of paper was the most staggering, the most exciting turn of events I could have possibly imagined. Immediately afterwards, we were shown a movie depicting Stalin watching a Red Army parade. In the course of the night, we stood on the terrace of the Berghof with Hitler and marveled at a rare natural spectacle. Northern lights of unusual intensity threw red lights on the legend haunted Untersberg across the valley, while the sky above shimmered in all the colors of the rainbow. The last act of the Gotterdam around could not have been more effectively staged. The same red light bathed our faces and our hands. The display produced a curious, pensive mood among us. Abruptly turning to one of his military adjutants, Hitler said, Looks like a great deal of blood. This time we won't bring it off without violence. A footnote stated, The Volkischer Beobachter reported on August 23rd, 1939, Tuesday morning, August 22nd, starting about 2.45 a.m., a very impressive display of northern lights could be seen in the northwestern and northern sky from Sternberg Observatory. It's interesting to note that Sternberg State Astronomical Institute is in Moscow. We also note in Spears' account the reference to the last act of Wagner's Gotterdam around Twilight of the Gods, linked to all the colors of the rainbow. The crisis in Europe deepened considerably with the news of the German-Russian pact reported in all newspapers on Tuesday, August 22, 1939. Russia creates a sensation, Reuter reported as follows, Berlin Monday. With all Europe tensely awaiting developments in a week likely to be decisive in world history, the startling announcement was made officially in Berlin tonight that Russia and Germany had concluded a non-aggression pact. Paris Monday. The presumption here was that if Germany decided to take radical measures now to bring her quarrel with Poland to a definite issue, she would not have to fear any hostile action on the part of Russia. Ten days later, the Second World War had begun with the invasion of Poland on the 1st of September 1939. Under the terms of treaties signed some 20 years earlier, both England and France were obligated to fight with the Poles against the aggressor. That declaration of war set off the mechanism created by the secret Masonic Illuminati powers in the wake of World War I. The night that Hitler got the green light from Stalin to invade Poland was also the night God gave the red light, the night the war was born, and the world committed to the chastisement our lady warned about in Fatima in 1917. Hitler was right when he said it looks like a great deal of blood. This time we won't bring it off without violence. How red indeed would the night sky be over Hamburg, when an air raid stoked a firestorm at a temperature of 800 degrees Fahrenheit, generating a terrible wind. The citizens called it the catastrophe. The night some 70,000 died, and it was said the sound of the wind was like the devil laughing. And Dresden and Tokyo, where an incendiary bomb raid killed almost a quarter of a million, and Hiroshima, terrible fireball that killed over 70,000 in seconds and so on. Only God knows how many people died in agony in that terrible war. No wonder God marked its birth with a bloody sky. When Reich Minister Speer wrote about that strange night in his memoirs, he was not holding a brief for any Fatima prophecy. And of course, on the night itself, in that background of the power games of Europe, on the boil, Hitler and his entourage would never have heard of Fatima nor cared anything about it even if they had. God tells us in the Bible, my ways are not your ways. It was just three small peasant children in Portugal who were involved with the heavenly messenger when Mary warned the world, when you see a nice illumination by an unknown light, know that it is the great sign that God gives you that he is about to punish the world by means of war. Even worse than the 1914 war, the lady had said, and who can doubt that all war is a chastisement of God. In fact, one could say the world has learned nothing, even from the chastisement of the Second World War. 
the rise of occultism and the practice of the black arts in satanic societies was noted everywhere in the Germany of the 1920s and up to the breakout of the 1939 war. But the synthesis of neo-paganism, Gnosticism and occultism that made up Nazism is far more prevalent in today's Germany and in today's world. This is why the chastisement that began with the Second World War is proving to be a prolonged chastisement. At Fatima, our lady warned that war was the result if men do not cease offending God. What offends God is called sin, so the moral dimension is the key to peace on this earth. But how can we have peace when, as Cardinal Hofner of Cologne stated at Fatima, on the 13th of October 1977, today we are witnessing a great rebellion against the holy will of God. Moral behavior has deteriorated to such a degree that it could not be imagined 20 years ago. And Pope John Paul II, some years ago in Turin, said, From the beginning of human history, humanity has never known such rebellion against God. Before he was made Pope, John Paul II, as the Polish Cardinal from Krakow, attended the Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia, USA, in 1976. And in his farewell address, he said, We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not think the wide circle of the American society or the wide circle of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. This confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. It is therefore in God's plan, and it must be a trial which the Church must take up and face courageously. The Cardinal on becoming Pope did not change his mind when he would have had a lot more information on the state of the Church and the world available to him. Some years ago in Fulda, in Germany, when the question of the secret of Fatima had been raised, and the Pope was asked, what will happen to the Church, he replied, in these two statements, it is made clear by the Pope that we are in apocalyptic times approaching the final confrontation between Christ and the Antichrist with inevitable bloody persecution of the Church. Such persecution has already been inflicted on the Church in Russia and Spain during the Civil War and other countries, and more can be expected. Also, the Rosary of Our Lady has a special mention as a great weapon for these times. Emphasis on the Apocalypse and Our Lady and Our Rosary are also found in some of the rare statements of Sister Lucia Fatima that have been made public. Once when asked about the contents of the third unpublished secret of Fatima, Sister Lucia answered, It is in the Gospel and the Apocalypse. Read them. A Mexican priest, Father Fuentes, who was appointed vice postulator of the causes for the beatification of the young seers of Fatima, who had died, Francisco and Jacinta, had a conversation with Sister Lucia on December 26, 1957, during which she said, Father, the Blessed Virgin is very sad because no one heeds her message. Father, the devil is carrying on a decisive battle with the Virgin Mary. He sees that his time is getting short, and he is making every effort to gain as many souls as possible. He wants to get hold of consecrated souls. The last means God will give to the world for its salvation are the Holy Rosary and the devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. When God in his providence is about to chastise the world, he first uses every means to save us. But when he sees we have not made use of them, then he gives us the last anchor of salvation, his mother. Father, with the new efficacy Our Lady has given to the Rosary, there is no problem in the life of any one of us which cannot be solved by frequently praying the Rosary. With the Rosary we will be saved, we will be sanctified, we will console our Lord, and we will obtain the salvation of many souls. In devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we approach the seat of clemency, goodness and pardon, and find there a secure way to heaven. End of quote. 
and from Our Lady herself the same confirmation that we are in the times of the apocalypse and the rosary is essential is to be found in her many messages to Father Gobby. In the twelfth chapter of the apocalypse we read, And now in heaven a great portent appeared, a woman that wore the sun for her mantle, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars about her head. Then a second portent appeared in heaven, a great dragon was there, fiery red, with seven heads and ten horns. In the next chapter, chapter 13, there is the beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. These beasts are identified by Our Lady in her message to Father Gobi on June 29, 1983. Now the struggle between your Heavenly Mother and her adversary has entered its decisive stage. The woman clothed with the sun is fighting openly with her army against the army under the orders of the Red Dragon, at whose service the Black Beast come from the sea has placed itself. The Red Dragon is atheistic Marxism, which has now conquered the whole world and has led humanity to construct for itself a new civilization without God. Because of this, the world has become an arid and cold desert, immersed in the ice of hatred and in the darkness of sin and impurity. The black beast is masonry which has infiltrated the church and attacks wounds and seeks to destroy it with its subtle tactics. Again, in another message to Father Gobi on October 13, 1985, given at Fatima, Our Lady has identified Marxist atheism and masonry as the united army of the Red Dragon and the Black Beast, with Lucifer at its head. With him are fighting all the demons who have been poured out upon the earth in these times from hell in order to lead the greatest possible number of souls to perdition. We can see from this message what sort of spirit guides would be readily available for all the New Agers enticed into dabbling in the occult and who progress into Luciferic initiation. In the Gospels we read that Jesus rescued people from diabolic possession. In Luke 8, 31 we have, And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? But he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him, and they besought him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. Again in Matthew 8:29, the devils cried out, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? So there is a time for the devils who are in circulation in this world, harassing humans, to be cast into the abyss. Obviously, when that time comes, they all accompany Satan. Is this a major part of the victory Our Lady announced at Fatima on the 13th of July 1917? In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. This is the Marian century referred to by St. Louis Grignon de Montfort, the great apostle of devotion to Our Lady, when he said, These latter times would be characterized by Our Lady's presence, which should be understood as a token and promise of the next coming of the Holy Spirit, with the conversion of the incredulous and the unification of all Christians. He also said that the final ages would be recognizable by the presence of the Virgin and that the power of Mary over all devils would be particularly outstanding in the last period of time. The Pope has said we are in apocalyptic times, so also has said Sister Lucia of Fatima and Our Lady is saying it all the time in the Gobi messages. The great victory of God in the apocalypse is described in chapter 20. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven with the key of the abyss in his hand and an enormous chain. He overpowered the dragon, that primeval serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and chained him up for a thousand years, and he cast him into the abyss and shut him up and sealed it to make sure he would not deceive the nations again until the thousand years had passed. At the end of that time he must be released, but only for a short while. Apocalypse chapter 20, 1 to 3. 
When Our Lady gave her message to Father Gopi on October 13, 1985 at Fatima, in which she identified Lucifer's army, the red dragon of Marxist atheism united with the black beast of masonry, she also identified her own army in opposition, all the angels and saints of paradise, with St. Michael at their head, and on earth, my army is formed of all those who live for the love and glory of God, according to the grace which they received in their holy baptism, and who are walking along the sure road of perfect observance of the commandments of the Lord. And our message to our army is, fight with the weapon of the Holy Rosary. It is with my army that I am preparing the way in which the glorious reign of Jesus will come to you and will be a reign of love and of grace, holiness and peace. To successfully disseminate their ideas, the New Age people have to destroy the belief of very many Christians in divine judgment after death and the possibility of eternal damnation. So they promote strongly the idea that there is a joyful existence after death regardless of one's belief, spiritual state or moral practices here on earth. Their so-called study of the afterlife is called thanatology, from the Greek thanatos meaning death. The best known New Age luminaries in this field are Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and Dr. Raymond Moody, author of best-selling Life After Death. The roots are occult, as you would expect, with the Eastern mystical and reincarnation just beneath the surface. At a public forum, Kubler-Ross has stated, Last night I was visited by Salem, my spirit guide. Dr. Moody, in his book, Life After Death, page 70, has the following. So, in most cases, the reward-punishment model of the afterlife is abandoned and disavowed, even by many who had been accustomed to thinking in those terms. They found much to their amazement that even when their most apparently awful and sinful deeds were made manifest before the being of light, the being responded not with anger or rage, but rather only with understanding and even with humor. His attitude was, I had been learning even then. End of quote. So, in the New Age scene, no credence is given to the fall, redemption, need for repentance for personal sin, need for faith in Jesus Christ, the reality of God's judgment. Instead, it is the devil saying once again, as in Genesis, it is not a sin to disobey God, you will be like God, you will not die, transmigration after death will save you when you finally end up in the body of an elect. This is the devil's lie. The truth is, as expressed in Holy Scripture, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Hebrews 9.27 Our Lord has made it so clear in the Gospels in many different ways. What the New Agers are really after can be seen in Kubler-Ross's book, Death, the Final Stage of Growth, page 166, where she expresses the hope that in the decades to come we may see one universe, one humankind, one religion that unites us all in a peaceful world. The, glo the global manipulators plan that religion to be based on Luciferic initiation. In these times, when powerful satanic forces seek to drag millions of souls to eternal ruin, Our Lady in Fatima in 1917 warned the world that there is a hell. She showed a vision of it to three small children, and the authenticity of that vision is backed with the indisputable proof of a massive pre-announced solar miracle. And yet, since then, apostasy has spread, and people do not believe in hell. The theologian Hans Kung, for example, spread far and wide his view that hell is a myth from which people must be delivered. Karl Rahner said hell will no longer be a reality at the final conclusion of history. For the neo-modernist, hell is empty if it exists at all. But the warnings are still coming from Our Lady. To Father Gobi on May 13, 1988, offer prayers and sacrifices for the salvation of souls, because I repeat again to you today, many are going to hell because there is no one to pray and offer sacrifice for them. The preface to the third secret of Fatima that was not published was that vision of hell. 
The last words spoken by a lady just before that secret were, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. The implication there was that a crisis of faith would affect other nations. A great apostasy can well be linked with a vision of hell because the Catholic faith is all about God's salvation and a great apostasy would bring many to hell. Father J. M. Alonso, who died in 1981, was an expert on Fatima, officially chosen with access to all documents, allowed to interview Sister Lucia at will. He completed a 17-volume work on Fatima. He judged that the third secret of Fatima, not yet publicly disclosed, was about a great crisis of faith that might imply deficiencies even among the upper ranks of the hierarchy. His judgment has been proved correct in the light of the messages of Our Lady to Father Gobi, messages such as apostasy from the gospel will one day become general in the church before the great liberating purification, July 75. Apostasy has already spread in every part of the church, which is betrayed even by some of its bishops, abandoned by many of its priests, deserted by many of its children, and violated by my adversary, 1983. By 1988, some had become many. Many bishops, priests, religious and faithful are victims of the great apostasy. What was foretold in the second letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians is being fulfilled. In an earlier tape of this series, the message of Our Lady was considered, in which she identified the second beast of chapter 13 of the Apocalypse, the beast with horns like a lamb, as standing for what Our Lady called ecclesiastical masonry, which has spread above all among members of the hierarchy. And she added, this Masonic infiltration in the heart of the Church was already foretold to you by me at Fatima when I announced to you that Satan would be introduced right up to the highest points of the Church. In 1980, Our Lady warned, only those who will be with the Pope will be saved from the threat of shipwreck in their faith. St. Paul in his second Thessalonians warns about this great revolt, great apostasy, and the coming of the Antichrist who claims that he is God. And St. Paul warns that Satan will work deceitful prodigies through the Antichrist that, quote, can deceive those who are bound for destruction because they would not grasp the love of the truth which could have saved them. The reason why God is sending a power to delude them make them believe what is untrue is to condemn all who refuse to believe in the truth and who chose wickedness instead. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10 to 12. The spread of occultism in the world today through so many trigger experiences is a real choosing of wickedness. When you have Catholic bishops and priests involved in this, then the church, the mystical body of Christ is deeply wounded and all the world suffers. This is a most important point to consider well. God reacts to this situation with a withdrawal of his grace and a spiritual blindness descends on them. When Holy Writ says that God hardens man in evil, the hardening is a punishment which consists in the withdrawal of grace. St. Augustine says, God blinds and hardens in such a fashion that he deserts and does not help. On one occasion, when Lucia Fatima was speaking with her lady, the mother of God said to her, Look, my child, don't be surprised if at certain moments a certain diabolic disorientation affects the best of minds, a disequilibrium, so that they no longer judge according to the voice of my son and of Peter. End of quote. The Catholic faith is a tremendous gift because it is a direct gift of God. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that faith is infused into the soul by Almighty God. He also teaches that to reject any article of the faith is to reject the faith itself. A man who has the faith accepts God's word. Now St. Thomas points out, God's word has set up the church as man's infallible teacher and guide. If a man therefore rejects one article of the faith and says that he believes all the other articles, he believes these by his own choice and opinion, not by faith. Rejecting one article of the faith, he thereby rejects the whole authority of the church and he rejects the authority of God, which has set up and authorized the church to teach truth. 
such a man has not the faith at all. This clear teaching of the greatest theologian of the church contrasts with the shabby utterances of so many so-called theologians of these times of great apostasy. In the days of faith in Ireland, which will return for all those who survive God's great chastisement, children in school were taught the catechism. Reading from one of these old catechisms, Dr. Butler's, the following questions were asked and answered. Question. What does St. Paul say of apostates, that is, of those who have fallen away from the true religion or church? Answer. He says that it is impossible for them to be renewed again to penance. That is, their conversion is extremely difficult. Question. Why is the conversion of apostates so very difficult? Answer. Because by their apostasy they crucify again the Son of God and make a mockery of him. Hebrews 6, verse 6. St. Ignatius of Antioch said that the person who corrupts the faith of God for which Jesus Christ was crucified by evil teaching will go into unquenchable fire and so will the person who listens to him. That unquenchable fire is not a myth. The Mother of God revealed it at Fatima in 1917. St. Catherine of Siena lived through evil days for the church that she loved so ardently. She was privileged to experience many ecstatic visions which God the Father enlightened her. In some of those visions, God the Father spoke of Jesus, of whom I made a bridge, the road to heaven being broken. And he said to her, I have given you the bridge of my son, in order that passing across the flood you may not be drowned. Which flood is the tempestuous sea of this dark life? See therefore under what obligations the creature is to me, and how ignorant he is not to take the remedy which I have offered but to be willing to drown. And again, observe that it is not enough in order that you should have life, that my son should have made you this bridge, unless you walk thereon. And again, the elect and my sons, keeping by the way above, that is by the bridge, follow the way of truth, and this truth is the door. And therefore said my truth, no one can go to the Father but by me. He is the door and the way through which they pass to enter the sea Pacific. It is the contrary for those who have kept the way of the lie, which leads them to the water of death. And it is to this that the devil calls them, and they are as blind and mad, and do not perceive it, because they have lost the light of faith. The devil says, as it were to them, Whosoever thirsts for the water of death, let him come, and I will give it to him. The devil, as we know, always tries to ape God, and also, as we know, the New Age movement claims to be building a bridge between mankind and Sanat Kamara, the rainbow bridge between mankind and Lucifer. When they have achieved world government, they plan that everybody will be forced to pass over that bridge. Who can now save the people of God from the devil's people? The answer can be found in the Old Testament. In that part wedded to the Fatima event. In the book of Esther we read about the plight of the Jews, the people of God in exile in Persia during the Babylonian captivity. Threatened with disaster, a pogrom, the Jews are saved by the Queen Esther, a beautiful Jewess. She risks death by going before the king unsummoned to plead for her race. The king at first angry, then comes down from his throne and comforts the frightened Esther with the words, Take heart, you will not die. Our order only applies to ordinary people. Come to me. And raising his golden scepter, he laid it on her neck. Book of Esther. The church sees Queen Esther as a type of her lady. Monsignor Ronald Knox, the great scripture scholar, wrote, who has a better right to stand in God's royal presence than Our Lady? The law which included us all under the curse of original sin was a law made for all others, but not for her. Who else dare touch the scepter that sways the universe? End of quote. 
Like Queen Esther in trepidation going before the king to plead for her people, our Heavenly Mother, who is the Mother of the Church, has gone into the Holy of Holies, to the very Trinity, to plead for us because of her Immaculate Conception, because of her Immaculate Heart, because of her fullness of grace, because she is the most well-beloved daughter of the Father, because she is the most admirable Mother of the Son, because she is the most constant spouse of the Holy Spirit, and because, as she has told us, it is above all my duty to fight and to conquer the evil one. Some years ago at Trefontaine in Rome, our lady appeared to a communist and converted him. She told him, I am in the Trinity. The significant date in the book of Esther is the 13th of the month, when the edict won by Esther is signed and saves the Jews. The name Esther in Persian meant star. Every time Our Lady appeared at Fatima, it was on the 13th of the month, and always there was that brilliant star glittering near the hem of her white garment, surely pointing to the biblical Queen Esther as a prophetic figure of the Queen of Heaven in her role in the great decisive victory of the people of God over the powers of darkness. We know from the Gobi messages what Our Lady seeks from the Trinity, nothing less than an extraordinary divine intervention, the second Pentecost. St. Louis de Montfort said a long time ago, these latter times would be characterized by Our Lady's presence, which would be understood as a token and promise of the next coming of the Holy Spirit. On September 8, 1980, Our Lady gave a message to Father Gobi in which she said, I will be able to prepare you to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is his hour, because through his powerful loving action the whole world will be purified and renewed. He will come to you as an ardent and burning fire. He will come as witness of my son who has never been so despised and betrayed in his person and in his words. He will come to lead back the world to the perfect glorification of the Father. Prepare yourselves to receive this great gift which my Immaculate Heart has obtained for you. Many messages have come from Our Lady concerning the Second Pentecost. Above all, a gift of my Immaculate Heart will be the new Pentecost. will bring my Church to a new splendor. It will be the spirit of love through the fire of innumerable sufferings who will renew the whole of creation so that there the garden of God may return, the new earthly paradise in which Jesus will always be with you. Let us remember that the 2000th anniversary of the Incarnation is rapidly approaching. The exact anniversary of an involvement that began for Our Lady according to the Gospel with the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Luke chapter 1 verse 35 When that 2000th anniversary comes upon us, will the stones cry out? Or will Mary, like Queen Esther, go where no other human being could go? and ask the Holy Spirit to come again. And could he refuse? The first appearance of Our Lady at Fatima is described by Lucia in these words, We beheld a lady all dressed in white. She was more brilliant than the sun. What power she has from God? Holy Scripture says in wonderment, Who is she that cometh forth like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army in battle array? Song of Songs. And this is the lady who tells us, If you live in my immaculate heart, nothing of what can happen can disturb you. Within this motherly refuge of mine, you are always secure, wrapped around by the light and presence of the Most Holy Trinity who loves you and surrounds you with its divine protection. She also tells us, This is the moment for all of you to take refuge in me because I am the Ark of the New Covenant. Message of July 30, 86. When Noah had built his ark, the time came when the Lord said to him, Take refuge in the ark with all thy household. Our Lady, the Ark of the New Covenant, has told us all to do just that. Every year at certain times, the following verses from the book of Baruch of the Old Testament are said by those who recite the Psalms of the Divine Office. For priests and religious reciting the Divine Office in times of apostasy and of the Antichrist, it has a comforting message. 
Take courage, my children, call on God. He who brought disaster on you will remember you. As by your will you first strayed away from God, so now turn back and search for him ten times as hard. For as he brought down those disasters on you, so will he rescue you and give you eternal joy. Baruch chapter 4, verse 27, 29. Finally, we'll end with the poem of Joyce Kilmore, killed in action in France in 1918 in the war plotted by evil men. At the foot of the cross at Calvary, three soldiers sat and diced, and one of them was the devil, and he won the robe of Christ. When the devil comes in his proper form to the chamber where I dwell, I know him and make the sign of the cross which drives him back to hell. I saw him through a thousand veils, and has not this sufficed? Now must I look in the devil, robed in the radiant robe of Christ? How can I tell, who am a fool, if this be Christ or no? Those bleeding hands outstretched to me, those eyes that love me so. I see the robe, I look, I hope, I fear. But there is one who will direct my troubled soul. Christ's mother knows her son. This is the man of lies, she says, disguised with fearful art. He has the wounded hands and feet, but not the wounded heart. Beside the cross on Calvary, she watched them as they diced. She saw the devil join the game and win the robe of Christ.